Welcome back. This is the sixth in a series of podcasts focusing on high leverage world language assessments produced by the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. My name is Nicole Naditz. I have been your host for this series. In this series, we are examining performance assessments for world language learners. In our last episode, Meg Malone shared strategies for designing and administering interpretive communication assessment tasks. In this episode, we will begin a two-part exploration of the integrated performance assessment, starting now with learning a bit about what an integrated performance assessment is and the theory behind their development, as well as what research tells us about why they are so powerful as a measure of student progress. I am so pleased to welcome today's special guest, Dr. Francis Troyan. Dr. Troyan is Associate Professor of Language Education at Ohio State University and co-author of Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment, published by Actful in 2013. Before arriving at Ohio State, Francis was a classroom teacher of French, Spanish, and ESL in Portland, Maine, Burlington, Vermont, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At Ohio State, His primary role is coordinating the bachelor and master's programs in world language education. Along with his passion for classroom-based assessment and world language teacher development, Francis will launch an online graduate certificate program in core practices for world language education in summer of 2021. His research has appeared in several journals, and he is the co-author of the book, Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment, and he has a forthcoming book, Genre in World Language Education, Contextualized Assessment and Learning. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. It's, it's great to be here and uh, to be talking about integrated performance assessment. Um, I've, uh, I've been, um, I, I'm, I guess uh, I'm a bit of an IPA nerd um, because I've been, uh, you know, working with it for uh, about 15 years now. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's always great to have the chance to talk um, about it and, and, and share and learn um, what, um, what, um, what, what, how we can, uh, I'm gonna skip that part, or we're gonna skip that part, and talk with teachers about how we can um, do this work in our classrooms. Absolutely, and it's really powerful that you've been engaged in this work pretty close to since its inception, I think. (laughs) Um, And there's been some evolution over time in the integrated performance assessment. So we're really pleased to have you here to help us understand some of the research underpinnings of it and really what integrated performance assessment is. So we're gonna launch right into the questions. As we get ready to dig deeply into this topic, it might actually be helpful to start by reviewing the key characteristics of performance assessments in general. How would you briefly explain a performance assessment in the interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational modes? Yeah, so um, so thinking in terms of performance assessment, generally speaking, um, uh, we can do, and we can have a performance assessment in any content area and out in real life. Um, and so it's that notion of doing a, um, a real world, authentic type of task. Um, and in doing that task, we're, we're learning, uh, learning by doing uh, in across different professions, across different um, sports, we, we see uh, different types of feedback on performance or performance assessment that happens formally and informally. If you play tennis um, or if you play an instrument, you're receiving uh, formal and informal feedback about how you perform how you swing the racket, how you play a particular scale, um, um, on and on and on um, across different domains. So that's, that's performance assessment, I guess, broadly speaking. Um, but then we, when we talk about performance assessment in, uh, and across the, the three modes, we're thinking about how we use language of course, um, from that functional perspective, to get something done, to do something, to uh, achieve a goal, to um, uh, gather information. Um, uh, the, the, the performance assessment that's linked to the three modes 
or one of the three modes, is having us do something that reflects what we would do in the real world. And, and, and some, um, in some teacher ed um, approaches, we talk about approximations of, of what you do in the classroom or out in the real world. I, I see this work that we do in integrated performance assessment in some way as an approximation of what we would do with language out um, in the target culture outside of the classroom. So it really reflects um, authentic use um, of language. We're bringing the real world into the classroom through these tasks and, and developing students' um, abilities uh, to use language in those ways, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. I think you really hit on an important point. It's making a distinction um, between tasks that serve a purely academic purpose and tasks that give us as educators, as well as our learners, evidence of how they're doing when it comes to the kinds of things they could actually see themselves doing if they have the opportunity to use the language beyond our rooms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and that, that's one of the exciting things or, you know, one of the one of the aspects of uh, integrated performance assessment that I get really excited about um, is how how it can help teachers to um, to see that and and to bring um, authentic language use into the classroom. Well, that brings us right into the next question, actually. So now that we have a kind of a solid understanding of performance assessment in general or review of it, what is an integrated performance assessment and how is it different from performance assessments in general? So I so. Again, as in, um, you know, across content areas or domains, we could have performance assessments, but we could also see and, and, and design a speaking, a performance assessment of speaking, um, and then a performance assessment of writing. Um, so write a letter to um, uh, your pen pal in such and such um, place describing a, a festival that you just, uh, that you just attended. Um, so those as can be performance tasks reflecting what you do in the real world, but they're not connected. They're in some sense isolated. Um, um, with the integrated performance assessment, um, we're bringing those three tasks, the interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational together in one, um, um, you know, system uh, or, or um, um, series of tasks that build upon one another and that are linked by a theme um, such as family or family life in, um, in Argentina um, or um, um, immigration uh, or getting to know you um, as a, um, uh, a novice level um, IPA. Uh, where you're using all of those uh, introductory um, and, and novice level functions um, to get to know someone in the target language. Um, and so, so as opposed to those three isolated tasks, they're all linked, right? Yeah, they're linked and they're connected by a theme and there's a, there's a flow that the students actually mm -hmm. understand contextually, like why they're doing the first task at this moment in time and then that leads naturally into the second task and they have this understanding of how the second task actually follows very naturally from the first task. Um, and they can actually continue building their knowledge through the tasks to support them with each subsequent task. Um, yes. It's yep. one of the things I always found really exciting about integrated performance assessments when I used them in the classroom myself. What would you say led to this shift in assessment? In other words, what need or void was the integrated performance assessment attempting to fill in world language education? Yeah, and so, oh, in the uh, 80s and 90s, there was a shift to standards-based teaching and learning um, in all of the, the different fields, um, uh, uh, English education, social studies, science, et cetera, uh, started developing standards. Um, and in the 
uh, mid nineties, um, the, the first version of what are now the world readiness standards came to be. And, um, what also came around at the same time was, okay, so how are we going to assess these, um, these new standards? And, um, because so the other piece that is related to that is the history of um, uh, proficiency assessment in the field. So those 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 came together in the standards, and then there was this there was really this gap for um, the work in classrooms. So what do, how do we do this, and how do we do it well in classrooms? And the a, a group of um, um, researchers and teacher educators and um, um, language scholars uh, from across the country came together at ACTFL and, and, and sponsored by ACTFL. And I, there, was, there was also a, a federal grant um, that sponsored this work, um, I believe beginning in 98 or 99, um, to develop the IPA, which was intended to be this um, robust, uh, exciting, uh, innovative assessment of the standards so that we could begin like the other content areas to have this really uh, meaningful um, performance assessment that linked to the standards. Um, we can also see the link um, to proficiency development, right? So that was also a very much part of it. Um, and so that was, that was really the intention of the, uh, the first IPA uh, the first IPA project, or the original IPA project, the design of the IPA, right? Um, it was born out of that uh, standards movement, but also this need for, for us to have a really um, um, systematic way of doing what we do with language um, that ref it let in the classroom so that teachers could see and learn how to do this type of assessment that's linked to um, proficiency. The other piece, um, so, so the standards movement was, was, um, was about reform. And so the IPA was also a tool for reform. And that reform was really moving away from um, the four skills and grammar oriented instruction toward this proficiency oriented uh, performance-based approach. So, so that's re the, that shift to away from grammar-oriented was also part of the standards movement. And so, I, I guess we can't talk about um, we can't talk about standards and IPA without also talking about that shift and and the IPA's role as uh, helping that reform along. Okay. Right. Like, you know, if there is a major shift in pedagogy and the way that education is done, designed, delivered, and experienced by learners, then it makes sense that the way we then assess our learners' progress is going to have to shift as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yep. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, and so the, I, there is, um, uh, so in, in I, I think the, one of the articles, so, out of that project came the first IPA manual, which Actful published, I believe, in 2003. Um, and then there was a 2006 article by uh, Adair Hauk and Glisson and, and, and several others that really introduced the IPA in that research project. And there's really a, a really cool quote in there that is, that is essentially that, that the IPA is only as good as the instruction that's linked to it, right? And so, so there is that, that sense of, in order to do um, really good proficiency oriented um, teaching and learning in our classrooms, we have to have assessments that um, reflect that because the assessments really, really drive what we do. Um, so. Do you bring up a really good point? Because some teach it could, I could see a potential um, for a teacher to perhaps invest on all, a lot of time into designing the world's most amazing IPA, mm -hmm. right? And, but if the instruction leading up to it doesn't actually support students to be successful on that, they really do have to go hand in hand. And that's what we know about, obviously, backwards design of instruction and, and instructional design in general. But it really bears repeating because although we're talking about performance assessment and integrated performance assessment throughout this series, we do have to connect that back to instruction. 
absolutely. When, and, and that's you, Nicole, thank you. You bring up one piece that I also forgot. Part of that IPA design was informed by all of that work uh, by Wiggins, uh, Grant Wiggins at the time. And he was a major consultant and, and, and really um, informed um, the IPA design as well. Yeah, so it's really, thank you for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, not at all, but that, that's actually really good to know. That was a new piece of information for me and it makes a lot of sense when I think about how it works, right? Yeah. yeah. To know that, that that involvement was there as well. And you mentioned, of course, that this came out of a research project that was conducted by Actville and funded by the U.S. Department of Education in 1997. Do you know what some of the key takeaways were from the research itself? Yeah, well, and so there was, there was the, so there was, of course, um, the, the positive end of it where these teachers were, um, and I believe there were 30 of them, I could be, uh, who participated in that. There may have been more, I, but I, I, we can check, I can get that for you later. But um, these teachers who implemented and were part of the project um, were, of course, to some extent, probably motivated uh, to do this type of work and explore this reform. Um, but um, they, they definitely, and they reported positive washback on their teaching, and, and meaning that it had a positive influence on what they did with students and how students experienced uh, the language tasks. Um, what was also notable was uh, how the feedback um, with students began to shift uh, because that, there, were, there was a particular model and uh, approach to feedback. Um, so the feedback was, also, was, was notable from that first project, but uh, also some challenges. Uh, for instance, I think it's, it's, it's an ongoing challenge uh, for us, and it, it's identifying those authentic texts. So, what are what are the what are the authentic texts that we are going to use to design uh, the IPA uh, or this particular IPA that we're designing? Um, and over time, we have to replace them, right? Because uh, an authentic text that's relevant today is going to change, and uh, hopefully, we have three years with it, but. Um, you know, in a few years, we, we need to redesign. I can't use my um, Céline Dion um, um, IPA from 1999. Uh, hey, now she's timeless. <laughs> she's kind of timeless. Yes, yeah, she is. She is, but I, not, it's teasing. Not so, so much anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it's, um, it's that, that, that identification of authentic texts um, came out from that, from that, uh, from that group as well. Um, and um, then some of the, some of the later uh, research, what we started to see is that as teachers started to take it up, we could see how um, different teachers at different levels uh, started to prior or prioritize different modes of communication. So we, uh, we would hope, and the goal is that we're addressing all of these different modes equally, um, but when we really look at it and uh, we, can, we can begin to see what we do and what we don't do and what we need to do a little more. Um, and so that was some of the, um, so in fact, one study um, that we did with uh, elementary students, that teacher, focused more on the um, interpersonal um, and very little on uh, the interpretive and in particular the interpretive listening and that was because she her focus was interpersonal speaking she did a lot of work with interpersonal in her K through 5 program and she couldn't do interpretive tasks particularly interpretive listening because she didn't have the she was itinerant and she didn't have the equipment. Um, so that was a barrier. Um, right. And I think too, that sometimes when we start designing our tasks for our integrated performance assessment, we realize we don't just need one interpretive listening and one interpretive reading, um, or for ASL, one interpretive viewing. 
We actually need some for, that are similar in nature and level of difficulty with similar kinds of questions for the practice activities leading up to it. If we're doing reassessments, we're going to need additional, right, for that. So I, I, I agree. I mean, a lot of the work I've done with teachers, almost no matter what the topic is of whatever seminar or institute or whatever it is, we always come back around to, yes, but how do you find all those um, interpretive, authentic resources? <laughs> Um, so beyond the fact that teachers can use IPAs to collect evidence and, as you noted really importantly, provide feedback on learners' current performance on tasks in multiple modes of communication, research indicated that IPAs actually have additional benefits for learners compared to other forms of assessment that we might otherwise do. Can you share some of those benefits with us? Yeah, what's... Um one, one piece that's interesting is, um, and so there's some, uh, some work that's been done um, both uh, in secondary programs, but also in university programs. Um, and the, just this, this approach to um, assessment is, is more engaging. Students report that it's, um, whether you call it more fun or uh, just more interesting. Um, and, and, to some extent, it, it has to do with that, that real world, that, that, that um, authentic nature of, of the assessment. I'm really doing something with the language as opposed to, uh, you know, those, the, whether it's a traditional four skills approach or whether it's the assessment type um, that isn't engaging the students in the same way. To actually do something with language um, is it has much more of an impact on 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 most students than um than a multiple choice test yeah i think they really see themselves in the moment of the task they learners can actually come to realize that they're using real skills so to speak um mm -hmm. that they see as being applicable Right. right outside of the class. And as you said, sometimes they find it more fun. I also noticed in my own practice with it, sometimes they were almost taken aback by mm -hmm. how relatively easy they found it, even though most would argue the tasks are in many ways more complex, but because the focus is on meaning rather than form, and we really do see a clear connection between the instruction and the practice that led up to it, they would come to the assessment and then at the end of it say, really? That was it? Because <laughs> no. I think they're so used to almost feeling like the assessments are a gotcha. Let's see what you don't know out of everything I expected you to learn and, you know, memorize. And that's not the case with the IPA. The focus is really on show me what you can do right. with the language we've been developing. And we can show them what performance looks like. Um, it's no longer, um, it's no longer um, you know, taboo to show them the, the test. Um, no the performance right because it's it's not a traditional test it's a right we can tell them what we will be expecting of them if these are the learning targets we've set out for the upcoming unit here's how you'll be assessed on each of them some of them might show up in multiple assessments we're going to lay that out for you here's what the rubric will look like right so that they actually they're going into the entire thing knowing what's expected of them and i think that's another big benefit that probably came out of this is the way that this aspect of instruction also shifted yeah. at about the same time once people started using the IPA. And imagine how, how so, you know, if, if there is this, this huge shift in terms of uh, how teachers um, are engaging students and how students are engaged in language, in language classroom, what that's going to do over time uh, to kids and um, our broadly speaking attitudes towards uh, language use and uh, 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 you know so that's the really positive piece that that over time slowly in making these shifts we're shifting attitudes as well about right. language use and language learning attitudes and mindsets and you know a much more positive feeling and that will translate that will go home with the students to their families right so it can have a huge impact thank you um, what are the characteristics of a well-designed integrated performance assessment? Right. So, um, again, coming back to that um, authentic text, right? Uh, so finding the authentic text that works for 
your learners um, addresses, you know, a particular set of uh, uh, standards that you are and language functions that you're, um, you know, trying to trying to address, um, and 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 that is appropriate for um, uh, what you know about their interests um, that you know is going to engage them. Um, and again, that's why you know that Céline Dion um, article might be really relevant to me, and I might think she's really awesome. Um, but you know, my kids. They, you know, who is she, right? Um, and why are you bringing this into the classroom and, and, and trying to, to sell this to us? So it's got, it's got, to, it's got to be responsive and, um, and engaging to them. And so, so the text, but also, um, you know, that overarching theme. So think in terms of what is a, a really compelling question that you could ask um, that would engage your kids. Um, and engage your students. Um, why do people cross borders? Um, um, and and that is per perhaps locally relevant. Um, why? Uh, what do uh, what do family structures look like in um, such and such culture? What is the nature of work um, in um, you know name a place? Um, so that you can really begin to unpack. And again, I'm using some of those, um, ex those, those terms from backward design or understanding by design. Uh, um, what, how do you um, set up, set things up so that there is uncoverage, I think is the, the term that they use. Um, so that students are asking compelling questions, thinking critically and discovering things. So I guess that's all about, I haven't gotten beyond the uh, authentic uh, text there, but the, that authentic text selection is really, is really important because it sets the stage for the entire IPA. Um, and so a good authentic text, something that you know will resonate with, with students and that they'll be um, engaged in learning. Um, and uh, something that they can also talk about. Um, so when we get to um, designing the interpersonal, um, it has to be something, and, and the content has to be scaffolded in a way where they're ready to talk about it. Um, and um, fortunately, we then get to do that during instruction and, 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 and build that during, uh, during the instructional unit or units that lead up to that IPA. Um, yeah, I, I think student engagement and, and interest in really creating something that's compelling and also that you're excited about as a teacher um, um, is uh, our, our, our key aspects. Right, like if the teacher isn't passionate about it, it's, it's going to fall flat, right? Well, why do it, yeah. But I, <laughs> I also really want to go back to what you said about a compelling question that the students are, are kind of unearthing and unpacking and digging into. Um, and something we mentioned a little bit earlier in this interview about how, once again, there really is this clear connection between all of the instruction leading up to the IPA. They've been examining this question in breaking it into parts and examining components of it and building their skills and ability to interact with documents that talk about it and discuss it and also share their own thinking on this question in micro tasks yep. all along the instructional sequence that ultimately leads to this integrated performance assessment. Right, right, right. right. And so uh, I, an IPA without a backward design is really not an IPA, right? Um, that, that's really, I guess, in some there. So make sure you're designing good IPAs and also designing them in that um, backward design um, right. um, framework, right? <laughs> I think that's going to come out loud and clear, right, from our conversation today. Um, so we talked a little bit about a couple aspects of the research, but I, you know, when I was reviewing um, the chapter in your book that talks about the research a little bit, I was struck by another piece of it. Um, what is the insert what does the research indicate regarding student performance across the three modes of communication where they had parallels in performance and didn't have parallels in performance that maybe 
the researchers might have expected. Right, and so in, in that regard, it depends on the, I think one, one piece that was, um, it depends on the level, right? Um, and so there was one study that um, Kristen Davin and I did with um, elementary students, um, grade four students. Um, and there we were seeing um, higher performance on the interpersonal, right, than, um, um, than other, other modes. And again, that came back to what the teacher, um, what, what her focus was, right? Um, and then um, Kisao and um, Adams did a study with uh, high school teachers who were using uh, IPAs. And in their work, they were looking at, uh, or they were finding, or they found that um, teachers focused predominantly on interpretive, uh, and I believe it was interpretive reading, um, and presentational. And so we can begin to see, um, um, I, don't, I mean, if we wanna call them trends, but at least in those uh, two cases, right? Um, there were there were trends that were present there that at one level we're focusing on uh, a particular uh, mode and um, at the at that particular high school level in that study they were focusing on um, reading and uh, presentational or interpretive and presentational and that in that case uh, I believe the claim that, that or the the uh, the finding was linked back to some of the traditional um, uh, I don't know if we want to call it grammar based but um, four skills types of approach um, and that that it to me is indicative of this tension um, that is part of reform right. Um, so we see one type of tension at the elementary level, we see a different type of tension at the um, um, secondary level. Um, but I think what's important is that, that teachers look at what's happening and begin to ask themselves some questions. So what, do, what am I doing? What are my students doing? What am I focusing on? And do I focus on what I think I focus on? Because the other thing, the other piece that was interesting in that Casal and Adams uh, 2016 article was um, that the teachers thought that they did uh, a more balanced approach, addressed all three modes, and in fact they didn't. So uh, we may think one thing and, and, and really do another for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, you know, maybe we don't have the time to address them all. We just don't get there. We, we, we're more comfortable with certain modes than others. Looking at what we do in, in, in the data uh, of, from our classroom allows us to ask those questions and, and over time make shifts. Right, right, really. It's become in the past several years now a lot more common for not only to recommend that teachers look back at their data, but for teachers to actually undertake things like um, analyses of student work, um, kind of breaking apart what they've put into their various grade books, however they're structured, to do an analysis of the degree to which that represents the depth and breadth of one's standards in any subject area, and in our case also you know, work in the modes as well as interculturality, which is, you know, another one now that's starting to become something that we want to talk a little bit more about in terms of um, where can we show evidence that we're really supporting our students' ability to develop intercultural skills. Right. Right. Um, and I think the IPA has a lot of, um, a lot of support to lend there once again, primarily through the focus on the use of authentic resources throughout the instructional process, including in the assessment itself. Um, but how do we like, how do we, and you might have a thought on this, you know, how can we really structure into our tasks, for example, for the interpretive mode, um, away from a simple kind of multiple choice set of comprehension questions mm -hmm. towards questions that get at nuance, that get at cultural perspectives and, mm -hmm. and help our students there. Do you, 
Yeah. yeah. And, and so I guess, uh, I guess if you look at, and if you um, work through or, or go down through the interpretive guide, right, that, that template, you move uh, through increasingly con complex tasks, right, identifying cognates first as the entry point, um, important ideas, um, but, but that, the cultural, um, I'm going to be honest, IPA hasn't done it well because IPA was originally conceived as an assessment of uh, the three modes, right? Um, and not the other, any of the others. It, 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 and we would always say we're addressing those, one of the other goal areas through uh, right. the, the, the content. But what I think um, and what I've been exploring with my, with teacher candidates in our program is how we use the new intercultural can-do statements um, to help us to identify what is the cultural content. And I honestly, I've just started to do that last year and play right. around with it a little bit in, um, um, with the IPA. So I think I'm using that as my guide. Um, I think I would too. Like if I went back into the classroom, I'm a 12 month administrator right now, but if I went back into the classroom, um, I would add to the um, interpretive task template, which um, I'm hoping we'll be able to link to both this episode and uh, the follow up part two of this, as well mm -hmm. as to the episode where we talk specifically about the interpretive performance tasks. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's a series of tasks there that teachers choose from. You're not necessarily going to do all nine, right. but there's a series of tasks. But I think what I would also do is just as you suggested, take some of those can-do statements, formulate them into questions from the intercultural can-do statements, right? And see which ones I can use to help me formulate tasks that dig even a little deeper. And also not just for interpretive, but you know, how can I give learners a chance to um, express themselves, yep. you know, in the target language. It's, it's a challenge because it's something that we realized as a profession that as much as it is a key and crucial part of our work, it is still an area where we have a lot of room for growth. And those yeah. intercultural can-do statements were a huge help. Well, and what I really like about the intercultural can do is that, uh, and, and why we, why there has never been, well, so once we get into, uh, what someone starts saying, this is the, this is what cultural knowledge is, it becomes problematic. Um, and so I think what the, the intercultural uh, can do statements allow us to do, what they allow teachers to do is to make those choices based on the content that they're teaching and also based on their, uh, perhaps their state standards, because I know that uh, we have um, a new standards in Ohio and now have culture standards uh, that teachers have to address. Um, but allowing teachers to make choices based on the content, the, the authentic texts, the language functions, and um, the other aspects of, of how they're addressing those language functions by studying um, um, travel to uh, a particular uh, target, uh, target country um, or um, culinary habits in a particular um, um, community. Um, that would allow, that does allow the teacher then to determine how, this is how we communicate uh, about this um, cultural content with people uh, in the language. Um, that's why, I, 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 yeah, so again, I would, yeah, I would lean heavily on those, those, those new can-dos. And you also brought up, um, you briefly talked about an elementary school teacher who was part of the research study. And that actually led to a question for me that might have a very short answer. Mm -hmm. um, I, because I'm not sure there was a lot here, or maybe there was. Um, did the research team notice anything in particular, or do they have any suggestions or best practices to call out with regard to designing integrated performance assessments for the elementary learner versus a secondary learner? One of the, so there were a couple of things that well two two that 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 came from that and I'll start with the 
the rubrics first. Um, and so that, I guess that's at the, at the end, but this is the one uh, piece that was really important uh, in working um, with the, the fourth grade students. It was not only important because we were doing performance assessment with them, but it was the first time that they were doing IPA. So we needed a student friendly, we couldn't, we couldn't walk in with that uh, IPA rubric from the, from the manual. We had to um, break it down into question forms, right? Um, or question prompts. Um, and um, that allowed us to get clear with them and also with the teacher because that became a, a tool that we used with, as we were talking through assessment using the rubric and feedback with the teacher, um, but student-friendly language, right? Um, even at the high school level, if you're doing um, IPA for the first time, um, you need to have a really, if you're using the, those rubrics as they are, you need to have a really in-depth conversation about what they mean. Um, um, and so student-friendly rubrics um, at the high school level are, are useful as well, right? Um, so I think the rubric language uh, was one, um, one piece that we designed together and in collaboration with, with that teacher. Um, but the other, um, and the, the other escaped me, we were talking about rubrics, but we were also talking about particular aspects of design, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, I know. It was the, so at that point we were using the first, still using the first IPA manual right the 2003 version and in that there was a um uh the interpretive guide uh was leveled uh according to novice uh intermediate and i think pre-advanced and, and then advanced um and in this fourth grade class we had students that in, in so in the novice level they it only prompted them to do three tasks um, the cognates they are important words, number one. Uh, number two was main idea, I think, and, and that three is important. I think three is important ideas. But the fourth is then keywords and context. Um, and we knew some of them could probably do that. So um, we, I remember being really nervous and we went and we asked uh, Eileen Glisson if, uh, if we could, if, can we do this? <laughs> Um, well, I think we actually did it and then we went back and said, well, what do we do now? Um, and that, that's the, what we started to see there was that uh, uh, what research also, um, other research also shows in, in literacy research, um, that it's not a linear process. It's not leveled in terms of, uh, uh, in the ways in which it was in the, in the first manual. So that was, that was modified in the, second, uh, in the second manual so that it gives teachers choice of tasks, right? Based on what you know about your students um, and what you, what you cover in the, in the unit leading up to it. So. Yeah, so that it actually really reflects the experiences that our students have had a chance to have and like you said what we know and that we're comfortable with i think um the conversation on the rubric language really is important and for you know again teacher discretion as to when their learners are ready for this but um not just not just student friendly language but then opportunities for students themselves to do some norming around the rubric by looking at samples themselves so that they deeply understand the the rubric by using it to evaluate you know peer or pseudo peer work that, you know if necessary created by the teacher um for for their use in order to more deeply understand but yeah if we're going to give students rubrics in teacher language you know, it's, it's not helpful. We were talking earlier about the importance of them knowing how they're being assessed and what it will mean, what success will look like. Right. And if they don't know what that is. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And then we're clearly not communicating right. what, uh, what we want them to be able to do. And, and that's the point. Uh, right. So yeah, as clear as we can be in as many um, examples and the other piece is practice opportunities. Um, uh, getting to know the rubric can also come through 
um, that reflection. So, so engaging in, you know, a random um, uh, yeah. interpersonal task, uh, speaking task, and then using the rubric to reflect on it. Uh, this is what I was able to do. And this is what I need to focus on moving forward. Um, so using, using it in practice tasks as formative assessment opportunities uh, that can be, you know, uh, very low stakes. Mm -hmm. um, or if you, you know, you have, of course, discretion of how you want to count those. But, right. um, you but know. yeah, formative being very low stakes would, is often considered ideal. And it gets back to that point of students really benefiting in all subject areas from ongoing feedback, right. you know, throughout their learning journey. And that feedback doesn't actually always have to come directly from the teacher. I think that's something that sometimes makes teachers, you know, their anxiety just wells up as they think about trying to give personalized individual feedback <laughs> on every single task. Um, it can also come from students self-evaluating and, and also peer assessing using those same rubrics. Yep, and as time goes on, they and, and they become more and more familiar with the rubrics, their their ability to do that that peer assessment. Um, and, uh, they get better and better at it. Um, and and then what's what's really great is that they then know as they go out into the world uh, the types of situations in in which they they can engage and where they need to improve. Uh, so it's, it really promotes some ideally promotes this type of self-reflection beyond the classroom too. That's, that's the, you know, the other. That's, no, that's a great point. That's kind of that ultimate goal, right? Mm -hmm. That's outstanding. Um, I, we're heading actually into our final question and it does kind of get at that performance and that evaluation of performance and, mm -hmm. and a, an important point for teachers to consider as they are looking at their students' work and helping learners and families and communities and others understand you know, what development of proficiency really looks like, um, especially since so many people have only had the experience of kind of grammar-based instruction and not this. So why is it important to recognize that performance might not actually be consistent across the three modes? Mm -hmm. And what are some implications of that inconsistency in terms of where they, they seem to place higher in some things and lower in others, um, implications for teachers and learners? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think, and, and also parents in, in there too, because it's, it's, it's letting them know uh, what, uh, what to expect, right? So that, uh, so that you're having realistic ex expectations about how uh, performance is going to develop across those, uh, across those particular modes. The, the productive modes, like, so, so, um, in, so, inter, so interpersonal is and has always it's, so it's complex to assess, um, and it's um, it, well, it's it it is the one that feels most like performance, I guess, other than you know the, the typical or the the traditional uh, speech, you know, pr presentational speech that's also has performative aspects to it. But um, so. Um, having realistic expectations about the interpersonal mode in particular um, and that they and what 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 a an accomplished novice speaker can do and what we need to be celebrating um, at that level um, and um, so that they recognize it and they know what development looks like I and I, I I, I'm focusing on the interpersonal because I think that's the one that, um, you know, parents will always say, I, and, and many people will say I took some, uh, you know, X many years of whatever language and I can um, say two things in it. Um, and, and so they might have a set of expectations that's based on that. But if we can show them what it looks like, um, and I had... Um, I had a principal uh, at, at, at a school um, um, in, in Portland, Maine, who did, uh, he was a uh, standards-based assessment whiz. Um, and he was really good at the community part of it and communicating to parents what it looks like. And every uh, autumn, we would have a, a community meeting with, with family members. And he would explain 
um, standards-based grading and assessment with a cookie, a chocolate chip cookie. Um, and he would do, a, a, it, he would talk about aspects of culture that are related to um, the chocolate chip cookie and cultural bias and assessment through the chocolate chip cookie. Um, but using his, his, using the image of a cookie and three different types of cookie, he would show what meets the standard, what is approaching the standard, and what is um, exceeding the standard in terms of a chocolate chip cookie. For instance, cookie dough is, is approaching because it's not quite finished, it's on the way. Um, and then there was this one bakery in town that did these amazing cookies and that was exceeding, right? And so I think that if we do the same thing um, with our um, students in showing them what novice level and intermediate level speaking looks like, they'll have realistic expectations. They'll know what it means to, to move from um, word level to sentence level, um, what that looks like on the rubric, but also what it looks like when someone's doing it. Um, and so I, that, I, I always think back to that cookie uh, activity in terms of talking to students about what performance looks like, but also talking to parents uh, about um, what, what performance looks like. Um, and yeah, it, yeah uh, I, I think um, uh, it's showing uh, and, and demonstrating again and again. Right. So that their sense. I think that's important. We want our families to really have a clear understanding of um, not including for those who are doing standards based grading, what that looks like and what it means, what it yep. means to be novice versus intermediate, yep. as you said. Yep. And I really want to close actually with, I'm going to bring back something you said because we're wrapping this up. Um, you said something really powerful about celebrating what an accomplished novice user of language can do, right? Because right? sometimes families, students themselves, you know, they, they get frustrated with not being able, they feel like they can't communicate in a way that that matches their ability to convey their ideas in their native language and they get frustrated and they feel like they're not doing well. Like they feel like being novice is somehow not doing well. Mm -hmm. um, instead of recognizing, no, we're aiming for celebrating you as an accomplished novice user of language who's going to keep learning and growing and studying, but we also want to stop and recognize what it looks like right now mm -hmm. to be successful and where you are already doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's where, you know, this conversation around IPA and assessment and, and standards-based and performance-based uh, assessment and teaching and learning comes back to and overlaps with advocacy because yes. you're really talking about your local advocacy and, and communication mm -hmm. plan with, um, with, with fam with not, not just with families, but with students yeah. and families and our administrators and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. And decision makers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Troyan, for spending this time with us. I think this has been actually a really fascinating look at the integrated performance assessment, um, really kind of digging into the meat of it and where it came from and what it represents and the potential that it really does continue to have um, in our language programs on a variety of levels. And so we're going to be leading from this episode um, into our next episode, which in episode seven, and that's the final episode of this series, we will actually continue our examination of the integrated performance assessment in a conversation on IPAs in practice with Lisa Shepard. So I hope everybody will come back and join us for that. And I thank everyone so much for watching and thank you again, Dr. Troyan, for being with us this evening. Thank you. And you can't miss Lisa Shepard. Um, she's, right? worked with our, she's worked with our teacher candidates. She yep. is, she is a, an IPA whiz, so you'll love it. Absolutely. Thanks again so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.